All right, I'm going to hit share screen and I'm going to say, okay, you can see me? Good. Where is the new normal? I feel very unsettled these days. The news is very confusing. I, I, I wrote in my, uh, my promotion that we've got talk of a bubble, runaway housing costs, Fed tightening, end of the stimulus. We had a show on a couple weeks ago about the millennials and the impact of the millennials all trying to buy houses and start families at the same time. We have record low unemployment, but not so much in New York. Um, we've got a lot going on. And now we've even, perhaps, we've got a world war. So with that, I wanted to find out from the top appraiser in New York, the best guy there is for figuring out what is the price supposed to be, what's the real value of something. And I wanted to ask him, where is the new normal? So our guest today is Jonathan Miller, founder of Miller Samuel Inc. And uh, I think you've been doing that since what, 1986, according to your biography. And so uh, you've probably learned a thing or two about pricing. And that's why we wanted to ask you on the show. So welcome to Burroughs and Burbs, the 50th episode. Oh, is it really? Uh, and yes. welcome Roberto, my partner, and Scott Hobbs, my partner. And uh, glad to have you with us. Congratulations. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of podcasts. And you're the man, number 50. Yeah. <laughs> number 50. So I heard about an hour ago from somebody uh, from a, a fellow realtor. Uh, modern house man, maybe some of you know him, but that he goes by modern house man. And he said, you can't fight the Fed. And I thought, wait a minute. But you can't fight the Fed. Is the Fed really the biggest influence among all the things I just listed? So I, I, I figure I might start with that, Jonathan Miller. If the all we heard yesterday, the top story after, after Roe v. Wade was that the Fed tightened exactly as much as we expected them to tighten. And I just didn't think that was the biggest news. Well, in my mind, uh, the, uh, the, way, the way to think about the Fed increase is, at least the way I think about it, is that they were about a year late, in my mind, that rates were too low for too long. Listen, you know, the the I think you know rates were just barely or just short of five percent in 2018 on a 30-year fixed. And rates, you know, the Fed tried to raise rates um, you know, at that point. Um, you know, and, and then once they hit five percent, they had to retract because of the trade war uh with China um, that was going on or potential trade war. And then when we had COVID, doubled down, rates fell even further. You know, uh, you know, in the in the mid to upper two percent range, which was sort of insane. And um, and really, the economy, um, you know, the quarter, you know, during and into the lockdown was where the vast majority of economic damage. If you look at really what happened after that, economy was just on an upward trajectory, at least for home buyers. You know, one thing I can't remember if I mentioned this last time we spoke, but, um, you know, the pandemic was punishing the lower wage earners uh, who tend to be renters or, you know, entry level buyers. Um, and it was, you know, much more no nominal damage to mid and upper tier salary types. And many of whom who had some of their best years, best, you know, uh, income uh, ever. Um, and so, Across Is the that U.S. also true now of interest rates that they are having with respect to pricing. We're going to get right to the heart of this. Is the right. rise in interest rates having a disproportionately high effect on the low and middle tiers of the market? Absolutely. And less of an effect on the Absolutely. higher it, market. The, and the, the, re, the point I was building to is that what happened is we, there, because of, in my opinion, uh, that rates were disproportionately low for the state of the economy, uh, they're sort of stuck at an unusually low level. Um, 
it it basically brings this premise of mine. I I, I meant like a couple of weeks ago to write a post about this, but I've been too busy. But um, that low rates make housing less affordable as a concept. You know, it makes your brain crack a little bit. Uh, but essentially, the way to think of it is. Um, low rates have obliterated, I mean, obliterated supply. And the reason for that is there's disproportional demand um, or the, the, the demand is moving much faster than inventory can replenish itself. And forget new development, you know, in, in any part of the country or the region, it's 10 to 15% of total supply. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, but that, you know, it, it's, if you just remove that and you know and let, or you could say well if we tripled how much we build it still wouldn't be enough right so um i'll take an example like i live in connecticut and um one of the, the market that i live in normally has 200 listings you know pre pandemic uh, the year after the pandemic it had 50 now it has 12 right and this is the narrative in you know Douglas Solomon's, you know, I cover like forty housing markets for them around, across the U.S., and it's the same narrative. the 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 exception to that is is really Manhattan. Um, not to say that the market isn't moving fast, but there's actually inventory is not wildly low um, at all uh, because it was late to the party. It started six or nine or nine nine months or more after the suburbs did because of COVID. You know, the vaccine adoption is what allowed the market to wake up in early 2021 and then was interrupted by Delta and um, Omicron. Was uh, late to the party seems to suggest that Manhattan, New York is just lagging the market, that they're going correct. to experience the same lack of supply. They just yeah, the haven't only ri arrived yet. So that would be the case if mortgage rates weren't elevated, right? So I think the way to think of it is, listen, Manhattan is uh, first quarter report, we were 47% cash, 47 and change, so call it 48% cash. So the impact, financing's impact is somewhat muted, but it is not, you know, that does not make the market insulated. It just makes it less uh, direct, sort of hand to mouth impacted. But it's um, and and it's even less of a factor when you consider the heavy lifting in terms of transactional volume is skewed, you know, upper half, you know, to mid to upper half of the market versus the uh, the entry level. Jonathan, um, when you talk New York, you're not just talking Manhattan, right? You're talking about New York Brooklyn City reflects that also. I'm sorry, I'll be more specific. Yeah, New York City, mostly Man Manhattan is the, the one that saw the most lag uh, in sort of getting going. Brooklyn, Queens, the, the outer boroughs were more like a hybrid between the, the insanity of the suburbs yeah. and the lag in Manhattan. There's somewhere in between. I mean, housing prices in Brooklyn since 2018, every quarter, it's been either the first, second, or third highest median sale price in history. Um, you know, and sales activity has been elevated. Um, and inventory, um, while there hasn't been this complete depletion in the city like you have in the suburbs, they're very different markets in general. The city has more supply. So brokers that represent properties in the city uh, have more competition. Um, in the suburbs, I'll, I'll tell I'll talk out of school for a second. Um, um, I, uh, I'm supposed to, in my mind, I feel like my responsibility is to be the voice of reason um, when it comes to sort of housing market conditions. And my wife and I bid on a property in upstate Connecticut, six way bidding more, 28% above the asking price. And we lost. We were, this, we were the highest, but we weren't You're all You're supposed to be the expert. And when your wife says 28%, that's the number. Well, the, the, deeper, dive is that the, the deeper dive is that the, the house is underpriced um, a fair amount because it, it was an odd property, but it was 
it was wasn't odd for us and um and they un underpriced so if you if they priced it the way i thought it was worth we only overpaid by 15 percent that was strategically it, done by them uh i i didn't have the benefit of, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it. It's it's a really hard property to price, but I was pretty confident it was underpriced. Um, but um, this is what I've been told anecdotally is that from the brokers in this area is that the um, properties uh, where there's a bidding war, uh, roughly half of the winners walk away eventually that they're caught up in the moment. And then the second, you know, the second in position yeah. gets the property. So we're hanging, you know, we're holding out, we're still yeah. looking, but it's just like how, and so to John's earlier point, like, you know, what is normal? Well, right now that's normal. Like I feel like normal is something, a condition that's existing for six months. Um, you know, and right now we're in a world where everything, every day is a new, outrage a new concern a new shock and so we're you know it's not like hey everything's the same for five years like we've had periods like that you know it's much more volatile um, and that's the challenge you know it's interesting because that is what's happening here people get they get caught up in the frenzy and they make when i represent properties that i have for example, I know that at the open house, we're going to have 40 people and we're going to have six offers or whatever the case may be. I always usually say I'm having an open house on Sunday, but we are also scheduling an open house for the following Sunday. Yeah. So we want you to take your time and we want you to really methodically think about the offer you're going to make. So don't just make me an offer tonight. Think right. about it. And that, that, that makes so much sense. And so one of, the, one of the things that we're seeing in the suburbs versus the city, so for example, bidding more market share in Manhattan in the first quarter was a little over 9%, meaning 9% of the closings in the first quarter sold above the last asking price. That is not a record. The record was 31% in 2015. It's elevated norm is five to 7%. So it's 9%. So, so it is, you know, it is a risk market, but it's not, you know, the outlying, at least um, for Westchester, Fairfield and Long Island, you know, NASA, Suffolk, um, bidding war market shares around 50%. Um, the markets I cover for Element in Southern California are 65%, with some markets being not sub markets being 90%. But sales in our new signed contracts report are showing the sales are falling in these markets. Well, they're falling because there's not product. There's nothing and to the, sell, right? And the evidence, and so you can say, oh, well, it's coming, you know, the demand isn't there. That's why sales are falling. No, when you have record market share bidding wars, that's telling you that the demand is still extremely elevated. Um, I think the way to think of the short term, meaning, you know, I think this is going to be a really busy spring for Manhattan. Um, it might be less of a frenzy than we saw because of the big, you know, jump in rates. Um, but frankly, um, I don't think it's going to have a dramatic input. I think the longer term, meaning six, 12 months down the road, I think, I think volume slows somewhat, but, you know, unless we go into a recession, the economy is pretty robust and to, to take it sort of to a super macro, you know, put aside commission thinking and all that, you know, volume, just think about, Rising rates are like the best thing that could have happened to this housing market. And the reason why I think that is because it is not, to use the word normal, it is not a normal sustainable condition to have 50% market share bidding wars. That, you know, as we know, can end badly, right? Um, I'm the surprised other surprised that both you and Roberto's market report both talk about rates as being such the big such a big influence. You just said the giant rise in rates, but they're still relatively low. Versus it doesn't matter. Everybody has short term buyer. Yeah. Everybody, the media cycle. People have a short term memory. You know, you start when you start saying 
you know, back when I walked barefoot in the snow to school, you know, I had it so much harder, you know, you know, two houses ago, I paid eight and a quarter for a 30 year fixed. The rates just collapsed from 13%. It was like free money, right? Nobody cares about that. Like it's sort of the, the sort of the, you're absolutely right. 5% is where it should be. That's a great, you know, I think it should be in the fives, but think of it at another, in another way. Think of it as higher, these higher rates, they're rising because the economy is good. Um, the concern is that the Fed is always kind of late, like they were late to raise, so they'll probably be late to, to drop. Um, so there's a, you know, higher odds of recession. And today even, you know, uh, Powell didn't remove the possibility of a future increase of three quarters of a percent. So you do think half. that the Fed's actions will have a chilling effect on the market? Not chilling. Chilling is highly negative. I think what it does is it is it it it's like a you know it's like the the bumpers in you know when kids go bowling and they hide the gutter. Um, it's kind of like it's putting like you know sort of training wheels or something to putting guardrails on it. It's moderating guardrails. That's the word. That's okay, the word. moderating. I, yeah, I was thinking I of like chilling. what analogy can I come up with? And I'm thinking of like bumper, you know, for gutters, uh, gutters for bowling. Um, I said chilling for a reason. I meant to say chilling, and you're like, oh yeah, that's too strong a word. If if COVID supply chain problems and Fed actions and oh, oh a world war don't have an effect of chilling oh. the market, what will? So, but the thing that I've learned over time um, is that the, um, you know, so first of all, consumers obsess too much about rates. They're marketed that way. You know, it's sort of like, you know, it, it means something and it doesn't really mean that much to your payment if it drops 0.02% and you want to lock in at that number. Um, I'm just being more philosophical saying that, you know, if you want a, a relatively robust or, you know, strong housing market for an extended period of time, you, you have to have higher rates. And um, uh, that's why we that. had the bidding war. So that's, so that's that. But my the client other reason, bank is the saying, other, do I, oh, wait. Do I put the house on the market this year or next year? And they want to know whether the Fed and all this bad news means they're going to lose their window. Well, first of all, the Fed raising rates is good news in the context of the economy, right? It's them trying to cool it off from overheating. So that would tell me that housing prices aren't going to be, you know, they're not going to be down next year relative to, to what's happening now for a couple of reasons. One is, um, you know, the example I gave about, you know, my, my housing market has 12 listings. So if it, if it increased five fold, it's still wildly low. So there's really a firm underpinning under prices. This isn't a high leverage market. Banks are, uh, are, generally underwriting is uh, much more conservative than typical levels. A year ago, it was about 20% tighter. Banks are 20% tighter than pre-housing bubble. You know, it's a million times tighter than the housing bubble because you just need a pulse, fog and mirror and all that sort of, you know, analogies that have all been overused. Um, but, but this is not a leveraged boom. This is a cash slash low LTV relative to historic standards kind of boom. Um, and so the downside for, for this is in the words, I think we look at or talk about on the other side of this is a, um, is, uh, you know, plateauing, moving sideways, as opposed to correction. Um, that would that would be my my guess at least at this point, Jonathan. Don't you feel that our like Man Manhattan being an anom anomaly to everywhere else in the country? Like you're seeing in Connecticut and other places, you're seeing prices spike. Here, right. there's just a methodical 
rise yeah, not. Uh, and appreciation so that that's such a healthy place to be, right? Like, I don't see that. Yeah, I, I don't I see another, the way I would describe it is that prices in the boroughs of Manhattan have been flirting with records or, you know, so they're not necessarily rising dramatically. They're just sort of, they're elevated and, you know, either hitting a record or close to it or, you know, as opposed to like, you know, they're 30% below and they're climbing back. Um, whereas the suburbs are up 20%. I mean, you know, many of the markets nationally, you know, depending on the sources, the numbers are like 16 to 22% up annually for prices. And, you know, obviously wages didn't rise that much. I'm going to show uh -huh. a chart while you're talking, but this is the chart and you see that New York is one of the few places that's not red hot overvalued. Right, right. Absolutely. And the reason for it is that it was late to the party. Um, you know, that the dollars flowing through Manhattan are um, even as busy as it is, it pales in comparison to what we're seeing everywhere else. Um, and so it's a more moderate boom than a full out frenzy um, that we're seeing in other housing markets. And, and so, for example, all those, you know, investment banks and, you know, national banks that forecast or, or you know, last year predicted 20% rate increases, price increases, give or take. Um, uh, and they were pretty darn accurate. Um, next year, it's five to 10%. And then the year after that is 5%. So, Jonathan, were the other urban centers like San Francisco, Chicago, you know, Atlanta, you know, these bigger cities, were they affected as much as New York? Because it, it's all New York got really hit hard, but it, I don't hear as much about those other bigger cities where people just completely left. So uh, they're absolutely uh, urban markets. So there's this fascinating thing. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, about a year ago, but there was a Fed study uh, put out by the Cleveland Fed, actually using I, uh, the New York Fed's data and uh, or you know uh, joined to forces with them, and they found that um, you know a lot, uh, uh, all the urban markets saw a decline in. Uh, temporary or permanent or whatever you want to call it, decline of population. And now they're all seeing it, you know, at least a lot of it come back. Doesn't mean it all comes back. Yeah. Um, but it was sort of an overreaction to a certain, you know, it was lack of information or education in the beginning of the pandemic when there was no vaccine and, you know, no one knew anything. No, um, no one knew what it was. We didn't no have, no one had was. gloves, no one had masks, no one had anything. Now, even if something were to come, we'd be like, we know how to dress up for it and go. Correct. That's why there won't be a lockdown, um, another lockdown, um, you know, aside from just political resistance and people just have had enough. Um, we were better prepared to yeah. how to handle it. There's all kinds of medicine coming in the pipeline, you know, so it's very optimistic in that regard. Um, but, you know, like John was saying, um, by the way, I just, for the record, I raised my wife and I, I should say raised three millennials and one Gen Z and, uh, all my millennials, they're, they're young millennial. I mean, they're young millennials on the young side of the spectrum, all bought houses in the last couple of years in the suburbs. Um, and the Gen Z is renting an apartment in Manhattan. I don't know if I can ever get him out. He, lo he loves the city. Like he doesn't, and he's a reverse commuter. He works in Connecticut. Wow. And uh, his wife, or his wife, his girlfriend, a Freudian slip there, um, uh, works in the city and loves it and loves all the social. So this, the reason why I bring this up, this is more sort of just something that I've been thinking about is that I think pre-pandemic, um, we overweighted the reason why people were in the city. It was, it was like 90% driven by um, employment, work, being in the city, access to work. Now what we're learning, you know, and remember that just Manhattan alone, the first quarter 
had the most sales in the 33 years I've been tracking. The fourth uh, for a first for a first quarter, I should say, the fourth quarter of last year had the most sales for a fourth quarter since 1989, since I've been tracking it, and the um, and the third quarter of last year had this high most sales of all quarters um, since 1989. So you look at that, and and the office towers in Midtown are two thirds empty still. I mean, they're slowly, you know, as a snail you know, climbing, but it's, you know, it's still like just under 40%. Um, and yet transaction volume is at all time highs. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, remote sort of changed the equation. Um, and so there's a lot of people living in the city that don't work in the city. And the stereotype- you advise, you advise your three millennials and your Gen Z or and they say, dad, am I overpaying? Is this, you know, is this, a, you know, are we going into a recession? Is this a risky proposition? You're saying, you know what? I, I feel pretty good about the next five years, 10 years, your value proposition, both in well, the Well, first of all, you're assuming and that in the my city. sons listen to me. Um, you know, it's, you know, a lot, lot of it's a uh, buzz off old man. Um, but, uh, they, uh, but, you know, we talked and strategized and like my one son just won by, you know, sheer luck. Um, he preempted a bidding war. Um, but, uh, and, you know, we, we, all three, we talked about it, my wife and I a lot. And, um, um, and I had no, First of all, I had no, I didn't see this as a bubble at all. Um, I see this as, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely a frothy condition, but I guess what I look at is um, because, in, so the big difference between today and say 2004, you know, the years leading, a few years leading before the sort of Case Shiller peaked in the summer of 2006, um, if you want to use that as a marker for prices, sales in the bubble peaked in 2005. Um, you look at those periods when the music stopped and sales activity turned off, um, you know, inventory was at record highs and, um, and it was at record highs, but we didn't see it because sales are rising faster than inventory was growing. So the market felt blistering but inventory was and then once the music stopped there was a there was a huge pile of supply sitting there we don't have that in this cycle anywhere in the country um every market i mean i'm saying in the country but i feel like you know I'm, at least the markets you know cover for element and then consulting i'm doing around the country it is there's it's a, a Inventory is obliterated. So let me give you, you know, that show where it says, you know, like you think you're smarter than a fifth grader or whatever. So this is how I would describe inventory on that show. What is inventory? I started talking about it and I'm, I'm a very nonlinear person. I went off on another tangent. But when you think about inventory, you move new development aside and you just think of supply um, as resale or existing product. Inventory is this blob. It's this living, breathing organism that uh, is based on the life cycles that people live in it. You know, they, they trade up, they trade down, they, they move a different location, they get, you know, they have a growing family. There's like a zillion reasons for why people move. The, the problem is that rates were too low for too long and you had people sitting for a year and a half stewing thinking about moving, why they hated where they were moving, what the options were, um, that inventory was obliterated. It wasn't, you know, it was obliterated. And so as we move through this sort of boom, um, even if inventory rises with higher rates, it has so far to go that um, this is a very different scenario. I hate those people that say this time it's different, but 
I must have oh. to hate myself because it is different. So I want to ask, I want to key off of what you just said about new development aside. I want to come back to new development. And, but I'm going to pin you down with a number first. Okay. I'm going to go back to that. Seven. Uh, okay. no. I'm going to pin That's you down. That's my favorite number. I'm going to pin you down because it says over the coming 12 months, Zillow predicts home prices are poised to spike 14.9%. CoreLogic and Mortgage Bankers Association predict prices will climb 5%. So yeah. my first question is, are you in the more bullish 15% with Zillow or are you closer to the 5% on a national rising of prices? I think it's five to 10. Um, it's, it's more than CoreLogic, but not that much more. Um, it's hard to be on team Zillow when um, they got Zillow offers so wrong, um, uh, and okay, okay, and and, and now, the reason wait, why wait. I say it, so uh, so so let me just let me just say I one thing. I have to say, Zillow, but I want to you know I got so many questions for you. I know, I know, but th this is important. So just <laughs> okay. understand, is that is that okay? So they're in the uh, you know they're in the sort of forecasting business. You know what your home is worth today, and um, and so nationally, Zillow is accurate within 2% of what it eventually sells for. But it's only accurate within 2% if the property is actually listed, right? Because you can see all the lines just move to where the list price is. Hey, that's the estimate, right? Right. If it's, if there, it's not listed, it's only accurate within 7%, which is atrocious. So to get from 7 to 2, they need you guys to tell them how much it's worth, which tells you as a general concept that it's garbage. And I, I think that's, even though they've won the consumer. So Zillow says 15, you're closer to 10, CoreLogic's at five. I'm under 10, but I'm not five. Now, um, how about New York? What does New York do over the next 12? Um, I don't, I, I probably, I would say that it's probably more like CoreLogic or a little bit higher and, the, and, and not Zillow. And the reason why I say that, even though we saw that in the suburbs. But you is said I think, they were lagging the market. And that would right, suggest which that would they imply, got to go. It would apply that they become like Fairfield, you know, New York City becomes like Fairfield County where, you know, prices go up, you know, you know 15, 20%, Westchester, all that, except that, in the equation now, we have a half a point increase. Um, and then we have probably two more half a point increases. And then we have three more quarter point increases. And so that does take the wind out of the sails. It doesn't make the market terrible. It just slows down the frenzy. That's why I don't think nine months from now, you know, that Manhattan is going to be like Westchester was, you know, last year. I don't think um, we're going to have that because our inventory levels are so high. We have great demand, which is absorbing it. And if anything, it's becoming a very healthy market where people are trading at very fair levels. I think that is going to create appreciation, but it's not going to spike. I just don't see that happening. I think. Right, right. Because yeah. there's supply. Like, that's yeah. your point. Like, there is inventory. There is um, and, you know, it's interesting, um, uh, you know, you know, the skew towards sort of the upper half of the market because of the economic conditions, um, that is a little bit exaggerated in the sense that summer 20, you know, when like the high end, the bottom dropped out the high end after the lockdown, as we look at what's happening today, Instead of the high end being the laggard or the the, the bottom of you know the, the lowest price points being the standout, um, uh, all segments are growing at about the same rate. It's really weird. Um, it's kind of like the market return back sort of in sync. So relatively, you know, relative to past experience, the high end of the market's doing really well. But in reality, uh, you know, because it's been, it had been weak for the pre preceding five, seven years. It's doing really well, but in the context of the overall market, it's sort of on par with everything else right now. 
So I wanted to get back to new development and I'll, I'll defer to Scott Hobbs and let him ask maybe the question. But so if Scott is looking 18 months or his clients are looking 24 months, three years out before product actually is finished and on the market, what do you see for the long-term horizon? Those guys are saying, I, I can withstand another half point a couple of half point rises, you know, I'm looking long term. So we just had, I think I see in the chat, um, we've just had a 10% population increase in the last 15 years. We've increased by 32 million more people in the housing market. Scott's not building them fast enough. He's thinking about building a whole lot more houses and he's not discouraged by a, half, a few half point rate increases. So would you say that this is going to continue for the long term, the five to 10 year horizon? We're gonna to continue to see price appreciation if builders like Scott Hobbs, both in New York and in the suburbs, start investing now in new housing stock. So I guess the simple answer would be, um, this is right up there with the meaning of life. Uh, it takes a five hour answer. Um, so the problem with new construction, uh, is you know in my earlier quip about hey hey if you doubled or tripled what you're building right there still wouldn't be enough um i'm being very simplistic when i say that because the default uh, actually default in the housing conversation is probably not the right word um but when we think about uh what is being built it skews to the upper half of the market um generally speaking because of land costs right land you know, land is what is actually, you know, predominantly here appreciating. It's not the building itself, like in a single family Builders house. Builders in my market are saying both of what you just said. I'm going to build at the high end of the market and triple is not enough. I love that quote. Triple, building three times as many would still not be enough. And there yeah, are some I mean, notorious builders here who said, I'll take all the land you could give me because no matter how fast I build, it won't be enough. Right, so, so think about what does remote really mean, right? Remote mean is a reflection, like the success of remote, you know, kind of the rule of thumb here is the more affluent you are, more wealth you have, the more mobile you are. And so I think what we're gonna see over the next five years, as we're really trying to figure out this remote thing um, in terms of the linkage between work and home, I think the emphasis is going to be on the high end, um, but it'll probably take it, you know, and it probably is already taking a little bit of a different form than it did pre-pandemic. Um, but, um, you know, I think the, uh, you know, I think the mix, at least over the next five years, is going to continue, you know, before the pandemic, it was about luxury. Um, I'm not saying that changes. I'm saying it becomes more viable. <laughs> uh, and then the other sort of outlier, which I haven't given a, a dramatic or significant amount of thought to is um, affordable housing, which really is middle-class housing, um, is sort of the holy grail of development if that can be resolved um, because remote get, you know, adds options that weren't there before. Um, no, no, because the laws haven't caught up with it. You're in, if you're in Connecticut, you know that we have what 169 municipalities, and and it's not like uh, Darien can use uh, Norwalk's uh, low-income housing or affordable right. housing, or right. Oh or no, Canaan can use Stanford's. Uh, each one is held to its own their own standard. standard. Yeah. So, um, and if they don't, if they don't meet it, they don't necessarily get certain federal tax dollars so they got to do it um but yeah i know all right i want you to comment on this brilliant piece of writing i discovered this morning are you feeling locked in and i'm gonna let uh i'm gonna let roberto explain what that means but in in roberto's uh market report this morning he said that people are uh not moving there it is yeah. Not moving. They're feeling locked in, locked into their low mortgage rates and hesitant to move on with their life's needs and decisions. You agree with that? 
I do. Um, I think there's a, a bit of that, but I think the one of the big reasons is because you can't find something to buy. Now, that's, I remember I'm thinking of the suburbs and what I just went through. Um, uh, but I think, you know, rates have been so low for so long. That is absolutely a phenomenon where people are sort of married to their rate and they want to stay at the rate, but I don't know how long or how, you know, how long that sticks around. Sometimes it's a matter of necessity. You know, you, you, um, you, you can't afford a, what you really want to, to make that move anyway. I literally am experiencing that uh, on several properties where people are just, they want to upgrade, but he's a, one guy was like, I have such a good rate. I just can't. And I said, you're, you know, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. You need to, you know, that it is one element in the grand matrix of what is buying an apartment and what all, you know, I told him, I said, listen, you can buy now for probably a better price and you can buy later. You can, you can refinance later when, when interest rates come down, but you cannot reprice. So you might as well take those two or three years for interest rates when they come back to at least begin to build that equity. You know, and it reminds me of, I have so many friends that they had rent stabilized apartments and they, were, they had a deal. And because of their deal, they never bought an apartment and started building equity. And they still are in those rent stabilized apartments. And yeah. they, they literally could have accumulated one, two, three million dollars in equity had they yeah. made the change. Is, yeah. is that in the city or in the suburbs, Roberto? Here, in the city. And is that a perception that, okay, I could move from my $2 million, I could buy that, I could trade up into that $3 million apartment. Is that also, number one, I have a good rate. Two, I don't believe that that $3 million price, do they think it's a bubble? Do they think it's going to come down or that it'll still be available to them next year? I think they're just totally focused on what the headlines are. And it's just, and they're focused on one item. There's so many items. And it's, I think when you're, you know, we're here primarily, we're selling people homes. There's a lot of it. I mean, there are investment properties being bought, but these are people's homes. These are long-term investments. If you're looking at a long-term investment, you have to get on with your life's needs. You know, you need that extra bedroom for that child. Your other kid has gone and now you want to save some money, you know, whatever. You got to get on with your life's needs because what you're going to do is you're, going, you're just going to lose out. You can't time everything. You just got to get, it's like dollar cost averaging. You just got to start investing. And in the long term, you're going to be better off. See, I desperately need a barn. That's why we're moving. So what are you going to do? Add that to your list. Well, we're looking for a you know a house with more land and I need a barn. You I see? Need a barn. And he's so, not going to wait for prices. He's going to right. get in right now. You're a fascinating case study. So you want <laughs> more land in a barn. How much land is enough land these days, Jonathan? For you? Uh, four or five acres. That's great. Okay. And a and barn. Then, what do you want to do with your barn? You're not putting horses in your barn. No. Uh, late 70s or early 70s, late 60s muscle cars. So Got that's it. my Nice. Idea. Okay. And, so, and how far from Manhattan would you be willing another, to go to I'm, get four acres in a barn? Um, I'm 60 minutes right now. And since the pandemic, uh, during, I call it the pandemic era that we're in. Uh, I only go into the city twice a week. Um, so are you willing to go 80 minutes now? 90? Well, see, I'm on Metro North and uh, on the train now I work. I write a lot of what you see, like my weekly housing notes. Are you and around all that. Westport right now? Uh, Darien, you know, the Darien um just after stanford so we're like um there's no four acre properties left in darien no no, no to, that's where i'm living now i'm looking you're going to have to go north my friend well that's what i'm doing because oh, yeah. three of my kids are a little further north and we have two grandkids that are up there so we just want to so right now we're like 40 minutes from like one of my kids bought in ridgefield okay so um, yesterday a bank called me yesterday this is a true story and i just want to we're going to have some fun with this so, and they said, I've got a, uh, a house that it's for, we foreclosed on. And as soon as the tenant leaves, we want you to put it out there. And they said, um, and we're going to say $2 million, four, four and a half acres, 
It's got a little cottage on the property and it's got a big barn for your cars, but it's in rough shape. So that's the next variable I want to identify to you. The tenant has been kind of, um, well, apparently that it had some water damage. So they just cut out the uh, sheetrock in the lower level. Yeah, foreclosures are way. always. And it's got some, uh, you know, some leaks in the roof and all that. Yeah. But are you willing to do work to get a deal? Because Scott Hobbs says that they're paying a premium now not to have to wait to buy it. Oh, yeah. There's a premium for uh, right now. There's a premium for, rent, uh, you know, renovated or move in versus, you know, getting that that deal. Um, but not as much as you would think, at least in the markets that I'm looking at, because there's nothing like there's no supply. So you, you're seeing a sort of a compression between renovated and unrenovated that's narrower, at least in the markets we're looking at, just Explain because. Explain that. Explain. But, but not in Manhattan. Not in Manhattan. No, no, no. This is, this is like okay. Fairfield County. Uh, no, Connecticut both of you explain that. Where, where am I seeing compression and what does that mean? The spread um, so, narrowing? So, in, so, so. So what he's saying happened? essentially is that there's so little product that people have to consider that. So right. therefore, there's not the gap. In here right. in New York, I have a property that it doesn't need a complete gut renovation, but it needs renovation. And I've probably shown it to 14 people, 12. The, the reason why they, they're like, I don't want to do the work. 12 right. of 14. That's a huge percentage. On a personal level for us, uh, you know, we started thinking about a move six months ago. And uh, so we renovated, you know, we raised four boys in our house, 18 years, a lot of wear and tear. Uh, we replaced, we renovated two bathrooms, replaced a bunch of windows. My house is 200 years old. So it's already, you know, um, you know, it has lots of stuff that you have to maintain, but it's in good shape. Um, but it was like endless. And, uh, and what should have taken two months just is finishing probably this fingers crossed this Monday. Like, I feel like the contractor is part of the family because I see them, you know, every third day they show up for half a day and it's, and so that's the nature, like, and then we just, you know, we order like new sliding glass windows, you know, we, there's eight panels and we get seven. And you can't find the set, the eighth one anywhere, right? So what do you do? Like, and this is so the renovation aspect. I understand what um, you know you're saying here is you know people don't want that, but I think when you get when the market gets tight enough, I mean, I, like for me, I don't want a foreclosure. I don't want to fix her upper. I don't mind if I have to fix you know a bathroom or two or update the kitchen. Um, but I don't want like something that's like, you know, should be on, uh, you know, uh, one of those uh, reality shows for fixer upper type things. Scott, uh, I, I, I want to I follow up on that because I happen to run into any of you who are in Connecticut probably know Itoro's appliances. I, I ran into Tony Itoro yesterday and I said, how's business? And he said, I've got supply chain problems. And I said, where? And he said, you know, Sub-Zero Wolf can't get Sub-Zero Wolf for like 14 months. And I said, yep. can I get an alternative? And he said, yeah, you, I can get you Thermidor. I can get you to the GE. But for people who want, who got to have Wolf Sub-Zero, they're going to wait a year uh, for those appliances. Yeah. And also prices too. Like uh, we have this unique sort of thing with a, a fix with a stove and, uh, uh, to replace it, the stove new was like twelve or fifteen hundred dollars. To replace it would be, and this was a couple months ago. It was like five or six thousand dollars, and uh, no assurance that you'd even get it in six months. Was that a wolf um, or wolf? No, ranking? I can't. You know, I can't Something remember else. what we were looking at at the time, but it was, it was, it wasn't. A, you know, it was, it was. It wasn't a the, of that caliber, and literally everything we looked at, b because we didn't we have a stove without a hood, sort of has the 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 vents pulling in, and it was just it was it was just wasn't available, um, and so what do you do? 
right? And that this is the, um, so we had it like most of the insides were placed and we could get those parts. Maybe I should get Tony Itoro on here uh, in the next couple of weeks. I did say, what are you doing about it? And he said, I'm placing the orders now for a year yeah. out. Scott, are you also, you can't do that because you're doing custom work, right? You can't pick the wolf for your client a year from now. But when we start talking with the client, we tell them you got to order your appliances now. So, I mean, no, you know, the, you're sitting there in an empty lot or you're about to demo a house and you need to order the appliances and we'll be lucky if they show up. Scott, ha we, we've talked about the supply chain a lot and uh, with you and it was really bad. I know that you were waiting 12 months for a sub-zero at one point, et cetera, et cetera, and you couldn't, and there were hinges and they were rationing them, et cetera. Is it getting better or is it sustaining at just an incredibly horrible level? It, it's shifting. And so, for example, I mean, some things are coming back and you don't have the same issues, but if you're trying to get electric service gear, can't find it, you know, six, six to six, six weeks to six months in order to get gear, depending on what side you need. So people have finished houses and they can't run permanent electricity, you know, in some places, garage doors, you know, whole developments where it's like all the houses are just have plywood boarding up the garage doors and the building inspectors have let them go ahead. And yeah, that was Toll Brothers. I, like it was crazy. And copper is right now, there's there's huge issues with sheet copper and getting that on, online. It's really with, with all the stuff that we're doing, it, it's urgency is one of our core values and you order stuff fast. Are and designers it, substituting for the copper, for the Sub-Zero? Uh, only, <laughs> most of our design partners don't like to substitute. That's a compromise. Uh, that being said, that there are some compromises that occur. I mean, it does happen. Actually, a question for you, Jonathan, is one other element. I mean, there, there is very little doubt that for new construction, it has to almost happen at the high end because otherwise the economics are just brutal. Yeah. Um, more and more, and I think especially with the pandemic, there's people that now, you know, that if they used to have one house, they now have two. If they used to have yeah. two, they might have three or four or five. How is, is there any way to sort of peek into the market and see how much like having multiple houses has driven this or is there a tracker for that so um if there is i have not been able to find it um i i can so so my you know my annual quest to get into the urban dictionary the term i came up with during the pandemic was co-primary and um use that and, all the time it's great yeah and uh and you know i'm i'm you know, I'm literally living off of the revenue that that word is generating for me. Um, but the idea is, you know, that second home. And so I look at it to answer your question in the context of the Hamptons, which has become a co-primary market um, predominantly instead of a second home vacation market. Um, and so, and, and, you know, the misnomer was people didn't sell Manhattan real estate to move out of the city during the pandemic. They just bought a second home, which became this alternative primary home or co-primary. And so there's strong evidence of that second home markets are booming because they're not second home markets anymore. They're- Co-primary. They're co-primary, exactly. Um, and that skews higher in the sort of, you know, the, the income strata, um, obviously. It's affecting uh, the retail in the Hamptons too, because places that would shut down for a season, they're staying open all year round. And the workers can't live anywhere near the Hamptons, right? That's the other big issue. Um, going in and out of the Hamptons from, from mid Island. At, for, forget it. Going there and coming out. It's incredible. Yeah. During the pandemic, I was coming in, I was out there coming into the city and I would see, I'm one day for, I spent like three minutes just counting all the pickup trucks. I mean, I was yeah. over a hundred just driving down yeah. the highway in the opposite direction. Yeah. It's incredible. But we, we have an issue that some clients say, it's like, look, I don't want to have to pay the Greenwich premium. And it's like, you're not paying a Greenwich premium. You're paying for the guy to drive the extra half hour to your house versus working someplace closer to home. Exactly. And somehow he's got to pay for the gas and his truck and his time and all of that. And that's, yep. you know, they're not just sticking it to you. It costs more to work in a luxury market. Absolutely. So what's the Fifth Avenue premium? <laughs> uh, you have a New York City premium no matter what. <laughs> right. The building rules do not help that at all. Yeah, I'm sure. So 
I just saw, uh, I'm going to hit share screen and say, uh, and show you that the Toronto home prices dropped the most in two, for the most in two years as rates slam market. Now I'm sure if I was in Toronto, I'd be pretty nervous right now saying, oh my gosh, uh, you know, Toronto home prices declined for the second straight month, you know, is, are we in trouble here? What are some of the telltale signs that we might see in advance of a drop in prices? You, I mean, you know, you oh, yeah. I mean, as a chart watcher. Oh, uh, so um, I think, you know, like I teach market analysis at Columbia for the gra uh, grad program. And, uh, and the number one thing you look at is inventory. Um, so inventory and sales activity leads price direction by about a year and a half nationally, one to two years. Um, uh, How about unemployment? You know, I, yeah. So there, there's two types of indicators, right? There's, there's uh, housing metrics themselves and then there's everything else, right? And so, um, so interest rates are not a great metric for forecasting. Um, employment can be, um, those are super macro and are less about nuanced changes in the short term, in my view, because the data is way, it lags way too much. And it's just, it's, it's not as, there isn't the precision in it um, that, I don't know. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with, you know, you can really look out 18 months based on the data you already have. And then the I, I could not have predicted the new Canaan dairy and Westport inventory levels a year out. Nobody could have predicted that we would see 200 houses in dairy and go down to 30. But that well, has been an, extraordinary circumstance that got it to that place yeah but, but even post covid it hasn't like you know suddenly we're not back to the new normal where we're back to 200 and nobody expects us to get back to 200 this decade. yeah but, but the problem with that as a sort of a test case against that data is it's a freaking pandemic um but post pandemic it's not no, loosening no but social you know uh, remote now never been a factor in the way that it is now. Uh, the fact that people stewed for a year and a half or two years brooding over how they hated their apartment or their, their home and they wanted something different, like all that stuff, like, you, you know, it, 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 it was a sort of a one-off, I think. It'll never be a one-off anymore. Um, external stuff is, listen, I, I read, you know, market studies, market analysis, um, you know, and it, it, it is really, I don't know, to call it BS is like too extreme, um, but it is, it has to be very specific, like property specific, then it, then it makes sense. Um, I think to say, hey, what's the future of Manhattan in three years, right? Um, versus what are the prospects for the specific development in three years? I think they're completely different scenarios. And the, the more specific you are, sort of draws you into, you know, the, the type of data that you can rely on. Yeah, it's very, especially here, it's so segmented. Oh, it's, it's. Yeah, it really is. So my, the final question maybe is for Pete. He was asking it in the chat, but it's, uh, go ahead, Pete, on speculators. So one of the things that we're seeing is that there are homes for sale, particularly in Florida, some around here, uh, we're in New Canaan, uh, and they're being bought sight unseen. It's almost as if there was a click to buy button on Zillow or something and, and people are going ahead with it. Um, yeah. We've had clients who are, substantially wealthy who are missing out on properties because they can't get there fast enough. Oh. So just, just curious, like what, what the outlook on that is. Yeah, that yeah, I, I, so, so um, yeah, it continues until it doesn't. Um, so uh, that's my sage advice. Um, 
So yeah, I know a friend of mine has a home in Florida, $2 million, new construction. It's probably will be done in July or August. And uh, they have people approaching them offering to pay three, three and a half for it. And, uh, but they don't want to. Why? Um, uh, because, at least at this point, because they're renting a small house and they just want to get on with their life. Um, they have small kids. Um, you know, it's not always about the money, I guess. Um, and, I, and actually, just to give you, this, this, is, um, this is sort of the, maybe I'm diverging from what Pete's talking about, but um, when you think about, so w one of my sons uh, just bought a house in upstate Connecticut or upstate Fairfield County. And um, when you're and, in Darien, that means New Canaan, right? No, 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 further upstate because he's a police officer in Stanford. Okay. So uh, he doesn't have the, <laughs> the same income for New Canaan. Um, but anyway, uh, every house they went to was a, um, you know, it went to, you know, when Multiple it came bids. on the market, they saw that it came on the market and, you know, like 18 people made offers and they were the second or third highest and they would never, they could never win. So on the third or fourth time, he and I came up with a strategy. We were talking about it. And I said, just, you know, sort of pin down, see if you can meet the seller. I know you don't want to hear this, but see if you can meet the seller and say, what would it take for you not to list your house? And uh, this guy said a number X, per, X over, and it was like 50,000 less than my son was ready to pay. And my son said, we can do that. They shook hands. And the guy goes, thank God, because we we're having a Super Bowl party on Sunday and all my friends are coming over. And the last thing I want to do is show my house. And literally, he left 50000 on the table. The broker told him he was leaving 50000 on the table. He said, I don't care. I'm selling it over. What I'm asking, it's fair. And I want to I want to watch the Super Bowl with all my friends and not have strangers traipsing in my house. So that was worth fifty grand to them. So Jonathan, mm -hmm. I guess we'll close by saying, what are you doing in 10 minutes? You want to jump in, the, in my car and go look at that foreclosure with the barn and the uh, four and a half acres? <laughs> it sounds pretty good. You can see it. his car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of car is it, John? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a little two-seater, a little cute thing. Well, I could follow you it. in my... Uh... In, with in my child, my Dodge Challenger with V8 Hemi. Also car. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, but it's going to be, you know what, you're going to get there like a lot of people get there when they come out to see these houses that need work and they go, oh, I don't know. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a big challenge if these houses need work. And I seem to because of the time, because have a of, bunch of listings that need work. And that's the only yeah, supply reason. chain, labor, all yeah. that stuff is, I mean, that's what happens when you come out of a pandemic and there's an explosion in demand and half the people were laid off in the supply chain and you got to scramble, but you have the highest quit rate in history and uh, people aren't put, you know, they have different standards now and wages have to be high, like everything sort of mentally has changed. So it's not just like, hey, I can't get this window. It's also like, I can't get an installer to put it in. Um, and that, you know, that's a, that's a bigger problem or bigger challenge um, for housing to sort of power through. And I'm sure Scott sees that. Jonathan, as I have said, for both real estate and for construction, it's the most miserable, happy times ever. I mean, right, right. So much out there, but to get anything done is it's just like, yeah, it, and, and it's, you know, I call this right now for many people, it's money on paper. It's like, hey, my house is worth, you know, 50% more than I paid for it seven years ago, uh, but I can't find a house to buy and I don't really want to sleep in a tent. Um, so it's money on paper. And, and forget about finding a house to buy. You can't find one to rent. I mean, right. a couple Same people thing. made the mistake of selling a house without having a place to go. And there's some panic things out there under yeah, uh, yeah, literally nowhere. Wow. Well, this has been a great hour. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank Jonathan, you, Roberto, thank Scott. You so much. Yes. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Uh, it was great. 
Uh, do we want a nice do we want to end with a prediction? Does anybody want to make a prediction on what's going to happen to the market in the next year? I did hear ten percent, but does anybody want to make their? I like your prediction of ten percent. I see the Darien, New Canaan, Greenwich prices. I see them going up ten percent in the next year. I don't see them doing twenty, but it's not five. Uh, so I like that. I agree. Yeah. And in, in Manhattan. My I think for different reasons, you're gonna see 10% because I don't think that they could build fast enough and uh, they are lagging the market, right? You, you guys can't build skyscrapers in three years, can you? Yeah, three you years. Okay. Three years? Four. Oh, building it's the easy part. Can you get it approved? Yeah, yeah, yeah the approval part is- Oh, if you're gonna add all that, you get a long road. Yeah. So I see your inventory tightening in New York as well, too, because they're only now beginning. Yeah, to but market. not. So I see it tightening. I just don't see it, you know, like we're seeing it in the suburbs. Um, I don't see it going down to, you know, hardly anything. But I do see it coming down. I mean, I think, Jonathan, I think your point earlier on, just sort of tying a couple of things together, the market slowing down somewhat is really good because you, you I mean, again, the you give inventory a chance to come on, right? And, and that allows for people to change houses. Right now you can't right. make a transaction because you can't move with more- We're locked in as uh, Roberto was saying, right? Yeah. Hey, Roberto, did you sell that two bedroom that you just put on like yesterday, the one on 11 West 69? Not, not second, yet. Second but showing next weekend. <laughs> Correct. I'm, I'm gonna it's check back with you next students. Thursday. I expect that to be gone. I hear you. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Till next week. All right, week. gentlemen. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, you bet. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. And this will be this recording will be on YouTube in a couple of hours.